Let's move on to monographs. Essentially, monographs is just the fancy academic way of saying books. Okay. Um, usually, though, it's, it's distinct from commentaries. Well, what you might call commentaries and monographs, there is somewhat of a distinction. Uh, commentaries, of course, focus on uh, a biblical book or maybe part of a book. You know, something like uh, Psalms, for example. You probably, if you're really getting into the languages and all those kind of things, you know, most commentary sets are usually going to have two volumes on Psalms, just because there are at least two volumes on Psalms, just because there's so many Psalms. But a monograph refers to a book. Usually, though, a monograph is focused on a specific topic. Remember, some of those general reference works are going to be um, you know, focused on a wide variety of topics. Right? And encyclopedia is going to have all sorts of topics in it. Um, but journals and monographs tend to be focused on a specific topic. Now, a monograph is going to be focused on a broader topic than maybe a journal article is. Right? So that if you're looking for a pet, for something on John 753 through 811, you may not find a monograph or a book on that. Actually, you can on, on that topic because it's, you know, so many people have written on it. Um, but essentially, you know, books are going to be focused on a broader type of topic. Uh, so something like uh, how women are presented in the Gospel of John. And that might be a topic for a, uh, a monograph where it would be a little bit too broad for a book, or excuse me, a journal. Monographs, uh, academic monographs as well, usually tend to be thesis driven. There is some sort of point that usually can be found in the introduction. Uh, here too, usually a couple of sentences, maybe a paragraph, but there should be a small section that you can point to and say this is what the book is all about. Monographs as well, academic monographs as well, go through a review process. So that when an author submits a manuscript to a press, first of all the editors will look over it, the editorial board will examine it and, and see if it's something that they want to publish, if it's on a topic that they're interested in. University presses is, of course, a large part of what we're talking about. Uh, and they tend to focus on certain aspects, right? Some university presses might not focus on biblical studies. And so if you're trying to get a book published with that press, they might not do anything with it because they're just not interested in biblical studies, right? But if it fits in with their editorial model and they think that it would be a useful topic for them to publish, then what they're going to do is, again, find two or three scholars who are going to review the book and review the scholarship again. Um, usually this tends to be a single blind review rather than double blind. And a double blind review, of course, is that the reviewers don't know who wrote the article. The, the, art, the author of the article doesn't know who reviewed the book or the, the journal. Um, in monographs, usually the person that has authored the book is known to the reviewers. Because one of the things that an editor, an editor is going to want to know is, you know, is this person qualified to write on this topic? Because right? as an academic press, right, is, is this person qualified to write on this topic? And so usually reviewers will know who um, reviewed the, or who authored the book, but the reviewers may not know unless the, review, unless the author uh, is contacted by the reviewers, which does happen. And sometimes the reviewer might contact the author directly and say, hey, that's a great book, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, um, but the whole point of the peer review, again, is to make sure this is good scholarship. And so then usually the, the press will get those reviews, and if there's something to work with, they'll go back to the author and say, well, this is what the reviewer said. Right? And the author is given the chance to respond to that. But the idea is that you know, this is meant to strengthen the scholarship. It is not just an editorial thing of making sure all the sentences are, are grammatically correct or, or making sure facts are correct and those kind of things. Again, we'll, we'll spend more time talking about um, those things and how to incorporate those things. Are there any questions about monographs before we move on? Not too much to really talk about with them as far as, the, you know, what they are. 
Right? So that's why you know, I thought it would be good to take the second part of the course and uh, spend some time reviewing for the midterm. As it has been, uh, we're in what, week eight now or week seven, uh, so it has been quite a bit of time. And so uh, there's some things I wanted to highlight, give you an example of some of the questions that will show up on the midterm on, uh, on Wednesday, but also uh, give you an opportunity to ask any questions you might have uh, about that. So let's start off with this. What are any general questions about the midterm you have, any, uh, any specific concerns that you might have about the midterm in general before we start talking about some of the, the more specific things? As I mentioned, the only thing we'll be focusing on Wednesday is the midterm, so once you're finished with the midterm, then you're, you're free to go. Uh, we won't be having a class or a lecture or anything like that after the midterm. Is this a uh, online test or like a written test? It'll be a written test. Uh, the, well, for the online students, it is an <laughs> a long line, but for, for the face-to-face uh, -face section, it'll be, uh, it'll be a written test. So it'll consist of uh, three types of questions. There'll be some short answer questions where you'll write a couple sentences based on a question, a series of multiple choice questions, and then uh, an essay. Uh, and again, the, the, the essays for the exam are on the study guide. So you, you have the opportunity there to look at those uh, essays. So here might be a type of question that shows up uh, on the exam. <coughs> Again, the whole, whole purpose of the study guide is to help you focus on specific uh, types of things. Uh, that way you can pay attention to certain things and, and maybe not process or spend as much time with some other things. Again, as well, the idea behind the study guide is that I want you to have a basic knowledge of the terms and ideas on the study guide. So, point or number two under part one is biblical, systematic, historical, practical, and contextual theology. You should know the differences between them. What is biblical theology? What is systematic theology? What is historical theology? And if you have a general idea of that, something like this should be a problem. Right? This type of theology involves the investigation of the development of different ideas and doctrines throughout the different time periods of Christianity. And four choices here, biblical theology, historical theology, systematic theology, and practical theology. Which one of those is the correct answer to this? Historical. Okay. Why? All right, so, yeah, exactly. If you, if you know the historical idea, or historical theology has to do with the history of an idea, right? That's the kind of things you would be looking for. And so knowing the difference between historical theology, systematic theology, practical theology, okay. All right, Lectio Divina, also this is number nine on the study guide, involves which of the following? Uh, extended examination into the original languages, searching for passages that would be useful in a sermon, research into the history of a particular passage, slow reading and meditation on a biblical text. See? You said that like you were extremely confident of your answer. D. <laughs> Is D accurate? <laughs> we have one mostly confident D. Anyone else wanting to back that up? Agree? Disagree? I think that's right. <laughs> it, it is D. D is the right answer to that. Uh, and so, so, again, understanding what Lectio Divina is will. It has nothing to do with the history of a particular passage. It has nothing to do with coming up with a sermon. 
It has nothing to do with the original languages, right? It's one of those spiritual disciplines. It's one of those devotional practices that can be helpful in a different type of way, right? It's not an academic pursuit. It's more of a spiritual or devotional type of pursuit. Number 10 and number 11 uh, on the study guide deal with embedded theology and deliberative theology. So, there might be a question that would say, you know, a short answer question. What is embedded theology? What is deliberative theology? This comes from the Stone and Duke book. Right? And so, if you're not sure about that, uh, you know, going back and, and reading that section, I want to say it's chapter 2, but I could be wrong. Uh, you know, just having a general idea of those, those two. So, which is embedded theology? The implicit theology of Christians live out in their daily lives. An understanding of faith that emerges from carefully reflecting on theological convictions. <coughs> theology meant to address issues related to marginalized people. The theological reflection on missional activity. A. What would be the? If this is A, what would be the? Okay. One of these. For these first two, one of these is deliberative and one of these is embedded. Yeah, no, the reflecting is deliberative on your own. Alright? So, embedded theology, right, is that, is that theology, just like something embedded is stuck in something, embedded theology is that theology that you kind of, you know, you live by, you don't really think about it that often. Deliberative theology is that, you know, I've spent some time thinking about it, analyzing it, those kind of things. What would C be? No, these would be, these might be more of a practical theology. This would be a contextualized theology, right? And so in number two, contextual theology, that would be things like liberation theology would be a contextual theology, thinking about the oppressed peoples, uh, how the gospel speaks to that situation, black theology, feminist theology, uh, and how does, how does the gospel address the needs or the issues related to that particular group. Right? So that's what that would be. Right? And so metatheology is that first one. All right. Stone and Duke gives four sources for theological reflection. Uh, and this is number 15 on the study guide. One of those is not it. <coughs> this one, even if you don't know, should be pretty easy to get. Which of these is not? Now, I try to put not in capital letters when I put it in a question so you know, right, or right, not. All right, so three of these are, one of these is not. It's C, word stuff. All right, um, and especially when you kind of see you know, all right, what is a word study? Well, that doesn't really help us much with theological reflection when we already have scripture up here, right? So scripture, reason, tradition are the resources for theological reflection. Anybody know what that fourth one is off the top of your head or have it in the notes? All right, scripture, reason, and tradition are three of the four. What's the fourth one? No, I mean, that's a good one. Experience, right? And so community kind of can fit with scripture and experience. So community is a good one, too. But experience is the fourth one that they list. All right? Short answer questions. And it's not all going to be multiple choice. With the short answer questions, um, try to get something down. Even if you're not sure that it's absolutely right, try to get something down. Like, if I ask for three things, like, if I would say, what are three resources for theological reflection according to Stone and Duke, and you can only think of two, write those two down, right? Because you'll at least get partial credit. Multiple choice can't really give you partial credit. Right? I can't say, well, B is kind of close to A on the page, and so I can give you a half a point. I can't do that. Um, but for, for the short answer questions, try to at least get something down. So, what is exegesis? A 
what I'm listening in that letter. Understanding what you're saying, understanding what you're saying, um, Okay, so it has to do with the study of the Bible. There's another component there that, that's really important for full credit. The interpretation of the Quraysh study? No, the interpretation would be more hermeneutics or theology. All right, so it's the idea of the original meaning. What is the original meaning, the, the intended meaning? So if you're studying a biblical text, looking for the original meaning. So X meaning out of, right? So you're getting it out of, the meaning out of the text, versus eisegesis, which isn't one of our terms, but eisegesis would be reading your message into the text, right? So eisegesis is getting the original intended meaning out. All right. That is number 12 on the study guide. All right, there's three types of general reference tools useful for biblical studies. Commentary wouldn't be a general reference tool. Handbook, all right, so dictionary, encyclopedia, handbook, all right. Um, now, in the multiple choice section, for example, or even the short answer section, I might ask you something like, what is a dictionary? Or, you know, which of the following describes a dictionary? And so knowing what those generally are, well, what is a dictionary? A right, dictionary is to focus on words and word meaning. Encyclopedia is focused on, is a multi-volume work, right? and so having that general idea of the differences is also good. That's uh, number 18. So number 18, what are the different types? and then what each of them are. What are some examples of spiritual discipline? Now, I don't think I would use that. I, would, uh, I didn't think about this when I wrote it. Uh, three examples, all right? So I'm going to ask for a specific number. So what are three examples of spiritual discipline? Prayer, fasting. Prayer, fasting, worship, meditation might be another one, all right? And so, Knowing, just knowing some of those uh, spiritual disciplines. There too, it, again, the question would read, what are three examples, for example? Um, then uh, if you can only think of two, right, those two down. So you get, you know, partial credit. It also means guess. <laughs> if you have absolutely no idea guess, right? You might, uh, you know, because I'm going to look for, all right, this is wrong, but is there something in here that I can give you credit for, partial credit for? All right, so if you absolutely aren't sure, at least guess. So prayer, fasting, meditation? Uh, yeah, there would be three. Uh, worship, 